What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. And me and Ryan, we're finally back together. It has been a long time, pretty much the whole summer. It's been one or the other or just alone or with guests. It's It's been, it's been kind of crazy, but we're finally uh, back together. So first of all, Ryan, it's obviously good to see you. Good to have you back. And uh, yeah, again, I was talking right off air. Congratulations on, uh, you know, now being an engaged man. And also it sounded like you had just an amazing trip as well. It was a really cool trip. Uh, I, I like to travel. I didn't get to do a lot of, tra- a ton of traveling when I was younger cause I was busy. So, uh, life tips are Ryan today. Get, get traveling in cause it's a lot of fun. Definitely. Definitely. So Ryan, we're almost done with the preseason, which is kind of, you know, crazy to, to, to believe it's weird having the three games. I'm not going to lie. I feel like, um, you know, I feel like there should be that fourth game. Not saying that there literally should be, but my like internal system is like, why is there not a fourth game? I'm so used to that cruddy, all the backups play game. But I guess you could kind of say like the preseason has sort of just been that for you know two weeks straight, which I mean, I, I, as a football fan, I will still watch the games no matter what. But it's been interesting to see how the less, the one less preseason game and this, I think more so really this extra regular season game, how teams' approach to the preseason has changed so much since what we saw, you know, just two years ago. Well, I think it shows you what uh, preseason as a good football team looks like. You don't have to play Josh, and you shouldn't want to play your expensive quarterback. I know Patrick Mahomes is a little more run and Brady's getting a little run, but there's really no need, especially if you have a banged-up offensive line, especially if you have banged-up weapons, and this is just kind of what it looks like, I guess, as a preseason as – a good team with not a lot of holes and not a lot of starting jobs up for up. There's no real reason to, to burn your guys out, even though even without that guys are still getting injured and uh, we're seeing lighter and lighter practices here. Yeah, that's definitely, I think, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we were being talking, we're going to talk about a lot, kind of a lot in this episode, but that's kind of, I think, at least from the immediate time for this week, uh, the injuries have really piled up. And of course you never want to see that. I mean, I'm, happy that at least it's happening now during the preseason versus you know in two months from now we're in the middle of a regular season here but it's definitely not good to see i think the you know a lot of these injuries to me i don't think are red flags yet the 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 the, the one biggest one i think that's been a red flag has been isaiah mckenzie we don't have any word yet on what the severity injury is he had an mri this morning we're recording this on wednesday the 25th so he got an mri this morning Showed up to practice in a sling. I saw apparently Harrison Phillips had like a sleeve on his leg. Uh, another guy who I'm blinging out might have like a cast on their arm. Um, yeah, Ryan, the injuries are piling up. It's not good. You don't like to see it. How do you think this could affect you know, training camp and the rest of this preseason? I know a lot of these guys aren't necessarily playing, but because they aren't playing, you know, these reps in practice it seems to be heightened importance on getting them in. Well, it's a bummer because some of the guys getting hurt are guys who've had good camps. I think McKenzie's had a good camp. Harrison Phillips has had a really strong preseason to put him back in that defensive tackle rotation. And the thing that kind of sucks with all this is even guys below them are getting hurt. So there's not even a whole lot of bodies out there to take reps right now. The Tavon Hester's hurt. Marquez Stevenson's hurt. He was out there doing some reps today. Uh, Not doing reps. He was out there doing some conditioning stuff and whatnot. And that's why you saw them go out and get a guy like, uh, what was it, Steve Sims, from Washington because there's just no one out there to take reps right now. So, you know, it, it, you never like to see it, but if you're someone on the bottom half of this roster right now, who's really fighting, if you're a Brandon Powell, if you're a Jake Kumaro, if you're one of these guys battling for that 51st, 52nd, 53rd spot, this is your chance this week to try to put something out there for either your, this team or for whatever team might try to sign you next. No, absolutely. And I, and I think fans don't need to panic quite yet because, you know, we're still two. you know, when this drops, we're going to be two weeks out to the start of the regular season. There's a lot of time for these guys to get right, heal up. Um, so there, it, it's not like this is, you know, urgent sort of like panic time. Uh, that being said, though, I mean, we're, you know, we're not going to touch on it, I don't think, too much. But, uh, you know, they're also, again, it was a COVID situation where five Bills players had to be sent home. I know AJ Klein and Matt Milano, I believe, are back today. Um, but Cole Beasley, Gabe Davis, and Star Lutule are still uh, kind of isolated away from the team right now. And we're not going to really get into, I think, this, you know, 
the talk of, you know, vaccinated players versus unvaccinated players, because that could take up an entire episode in of its own. But it just goes to show, though, you know, th- this is going to be a factor throughout the season. And just like last year, I mean, if something like this happens, this could, you know, affect a game for the Bills, not, you know, regardless of what your stances are on, you know, vaccines or not, because missing five days, I mean, this time's up where, you know, there's a close contact on a Wednesday or a Thursday. I mean, all those guys who are the close contacts, they're not playing on Sunday. Yeah, the, the point of this the point of this rule is to encourage guys to get vaccinated and make life harder for unvaccinated people. So regardless of what I think about facts, what Mitch thinks about vaccines, and what anyone thinks about vaccines, all we're saying here is that this if they get in contact with someone on the team, off the team, they are gonna have to miss time even if they test negative, that's the rules this year. You can, we can talk about how they don't make sense. We can talk about how they're stupid, but that's going to be the reality of this year. And this is kind of a taste of that. So it's something that, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen a ton. It did come up that, you know, this team isn't super vaccinated compared to a lot of teams. The we reported today, Washington was at 93%. They're the 23rd ranked uh, team in terms of vaccination rates. So it's something that might become a real issue our stances to the side. So it's just something as, as fans to watch through throughout the year. And we just hope that it doesn't come up, come back to uh, bite the seam in the butt. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, loving this all together. I mean, it's just been a lot of absences, you know, for the bills and, and a lot of key players aren't practicing, but like you mentioned, this has opened the door for a lot of these bottom of the roster guys. And, you know, I think it kind of segues nicely into, you know, we had a game, uh, which I seems like forever ago from all this, you know, injury and COVID stuff that's happened this week. But just a few days ago, the Bills had a game against the Bears, Ryan, and they looked outstanding. I know it was preseason. I know the Bears have their issues, but the Bills played majority of their twos and threes, not a lot of ones played, and they dominated. And we saw a lot of these guys fighting for roster spots and maybe even some starter roles really uh, play a quality game. So I kind of want to get into it. And first ask you, Ryan, you know, what or who sort of stood out for you? What was the number one thing that stood out for me? What was your biggest takeaway from this Bears game? I have three guys, and I, I tweeted out during the game, three guys who were really stood out to me who were all three draft picks this year. And the first guy I'll start with is Gregory Rousseau, a guy that I don't think either of us, I think I wasn't high on in the draft process, wasn't super high on the draft pick, but not – just practice now, had some really great practices. Had a beat Penny Sewell, a rookie, in that first game. And then against a veteran starting left tackle, had a great game against the Bears. Gregory Rousseau is looking phenomenal. And like I said with Bruce last week, he's looking phenomenal without having pass rush moves. He's looking phenomenal with just beating guys with his length and size. He looks like a guy who's going to produce this year. And I'm absolutely shocked that he's played as well. I think we got to pump the brakes a little bit on some of the, oh, he's going to have 10 sacks. So, you know, we talked about on this podcast before during the draft process, Chase Young had seven sacks. He was defensive rookie of the year, and he was a menace on that team. If we get a five-sack season out of Gregory Rousseau and a bunch of pressures and he's playing 40 50% of the decline, that's going to be phenomenal. So that's my one. My number two is I have Spencer Brown. Didn't play super great against Detroit. Uh, you know, he looks great in the run game. He looks about as pro ready as you can in the run game. Going to be a super great addition to those run sets, those jumbo sets, those goal line sets that Dable loves to run with an extra tackle. But he looked, he put, he shut down Khalil Mack in that game. He, he locked down pass protection. So I don't know what tape you watch. I don't know what Bob, uh, what Bobby Johnson was putting into his head, but something worked and he took a huge step up and all of a sudden, at a position that, you know, with Dawkins going to the hospital last week and we weren't feeling great about the depth, all of a sudden we feel a little bit better about the depth, and he's a guy who's going to contribute. And the third guy I have is DeMar Hamlin. He is going to – he's not going to be a starting safety, but he's going to force his way into some reps, whether it's that third safety, dime packages. That dude can hit. He has a nose for the football. He doesn't get beat. When you think about Sean McDermott, safeties or John McDermott defensive backs. He's the type of dude that John McDermott loves just hard hitting knows for the ball tackles through dudes and just isn't afraid to get in there and get messy. So those three rookies in a draft class, that I think a lot of people didn't love all have paths to contribute 
this season, which would be phenomenal for a team that drafted 30th. I really like those points you brought up. And I think with you're starting with Rousseau, what we have seen from him, I think is kind of what we saw from him in Miami in 2019, which is just a guy who doesn't really know what he's doing, but he's so athletic. He's so long. He's so strong that he's still producing nonetheless. And I think that's really encouraging because a lot of people talked about how his sacks were all, you know, being in the right place at the right time and the quarterback running into him. But, you know, again, I'm not saying this is going to be a 10 sack rookie because as you said, Ryan, that just doesn't happen to I me. Mean, Chase Young had seven. I think this, the rookie who was second in sacks last year, I want to say it was actually um, Alton Robinson from Syracuse. I think he had Eric four. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, he only, but he only had four. He was number two. You know, so like rookies don't necessarily put up crazy sack numbers. And we've only really seen from like what, like Nick Bosa really over the last couple of years. But the fact of the matter is that, listen, Rousseau's finding ways to get the quarterback and he's doing it as such a raw prospect. So I think Bills fans, you know, you definitely be excited about him and his future and what he can do in 2020. Spencer Brown was another player. I actually did write down in my notes too. Um, he was kind of terrible against Detroit, to be honest, but he was really solid uh, against the Bears. Good in the run game, was a lot better in pass protection. Uh, and that that definitely makes me feel a lot more comfortable about the tackle depth. Just seeing him improve because, you know, we were starting to get worried here because Bobby Hart obviously is just a nightmare and is not possibly making this roster or really shouldn't be on any roster for that matter. So the fact that Spencer Brown starting to settle in, I think is encouraging. And then I like that you brought up Tamar Hamlin because you know, he is in a little bit of a battle with Josh Thomas, and that, that safety room is kind of loaded right now. I don't, I don't think people realize how good Hamlin was going to be, how good Josh Thomas was going to be. Like, they got five safeties on that roster that are totally NFL caliber players and up, which I think is really good. There's a couple other players I wanted to touch on. Um, for me, the first thing I wrote down was Trubisky, and not just because it was the revenge game, but in all honesty, like, I really was impressed with Mitch, and I think that what you saw from him against the Bears – was exactly what you wanted to see, which is listen, of course, like knock on wood, like I, you know, Josh Allen, we don't want to see him go down at all at any point this year, but let's just say Josh Allen does get an injury, right? Has to miss two or three games. I'm confident that with the playmakers the Bills have and with the, you know, with, with Brian Dable and how he can really kind of call a game to a player's strengths. I don't think that the Bills are going to be in, dire straits at all with Mitch Trubisky. I thought he looked comfortable. He showed you some athleticism. He had some throws I'm sure he'd want to have back, but honestly, I, I liked what I saw from him. Uh, another guy I, really, I wanted to touch on was Motor. You know, Devin Singletary, I'm not saying that I am full-heartedly all in that this is RB1 because I don't think that exists in this offense. I, I, I've been a firm believer this is a running back by committee approach, but like Devin Singletary has looked really freaking good. This is Exactly, I think, what we thought we were going to see last year from him. This is kind of what we saw rookie year, where, of course, he still doesn't have the long speed, but the burst is there, the decisiveness is there, the, you know, the ability to break tackles is there. He's made some good catches out of the backfield, which is something I know he worked on a lot this offseason. And his, his touchdown, that- if you stop his touchdown behind and you take a screenshot, someone posted on Twitter a screenshot right behind the line of scrimmage before he made his cut up field. And you would if if you just look at that picture, it looks like it should have been a loss. That that it, oh, it, reminds, it reminds me of that Steelers play he almost had for a touchdown two years ago in that game where he didn't have a lot of room and he just picked his way through. That's a lot of stuff we saw as a rookie. Absolutely, yeah. No, he he was. I mean, he looked like he was totally, you know, like a, like a dead duck on that. I think he had three bears surrounding him, and you know, he put a little. Which I know Marcel's been a big fan of that dead leg move he has. Which I I mean, I can't lie, it, it is a nasty dead leg that he has, and he's just making plays and that's huge because we've talked about it that run game was needs to pick it up and in 2021 this team i think wants to you know get over that hump a little bit and so far singletary has been everything that you've you know wanted and i think the the last thing i wanted to touch on it i don't, I don't want to be like a negative guy because that game had so many positives i've officially i think given up on saran neal has a, a role in the defense i i know that was one bad rep but it just seems like that this guy, and, and listen, I'm a big Saran Neal fan. I think he's an outstanding special teams player and a guy I'd like to see on the Bills kind of be their version of Matthew Slater, right? We're just on the roster for a long time. Great, great special teams guy, but you would never dare 
really line up Matt, you know, Matt Slater, you know, 20 times a game to run routes uh, against the, you know, our real offense and our against a real defense in a game. And I think that's kind of what we have to come to come to terms with is that listen, it's Ron Neal is just not, he doesn't really have a, a home on defense and listen, it's okay. There's guys like him in the NFL that survive and make it for a decade plus. And I think that's probably what he is, but it, it definitely was too bad because I was looking forward to seeing, you know, could this guy find himself a role? There was a lot of praise for him during training camp, but I think after two preseason games, I think I've kind of seen enough of, of Saran now. I think that he's really just uh, a primary special teams guy, and that's kind of it. You know, when McDermott says he doesn't want a big nickel, and, and we talked about that in the pre-draft process, it, it's not that they don't want a big nickel because they've always been looking for these kind of hybrid guys. They get drafted him. He hasn't worked out. So who have they turned to now? DeMar Hamlin. They try to play mm-hmm. Dean Marlowe in that role a little bit, but now it, it's DeMar Hamlin's role, and he's going to be that guy who they wanted uh, Neil to be, I think, this season. At least that's what he's looking like. And and one more note on Mitch. I think that we have the positive to take out from that. If he doesn't play, I we don't know. They haven't come out yet at the time of this recording what the, what the lineup's going to look like for Saturday. But if this is the last tape he puts out before he hits free agency in the, in the in March, we could have a nice little comp pick have, have coming our way. Especially if, let's say, Brian Dable takes him to go where he with to his next stop is the bridge quarterback. So, Mitch Trubisky might have earned him a nice little chunk of change here with this performance as well. Yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, it, it was impressive, and you know, for Bears fans, that also had I me mean, as a side note that had to be hard to watch just because. You saw the guy that your team gave up on you play so well. And then you've seen the situations going on there with Andy Dull and how, frankly, how awful he's looked so far this preseason. Like it, I, I got to say, like, and we saw it today, you know, with the, with the Broncos finally naming uh, Teddy Bridgewater's their, their starting quarterback. I know this is a little off topic, but how good does it feel to not be in like that quarterback purgatory of just, you have no idea what's going on. Who's going to be the starter week one versus week, you know, 17. Like it, it is just so nice to just not have that drama going around because it wasn't long ago where the Bills were truly one of these teams and that were struggling like this to find a quarterback and can never seem to get it right. And it, it, it's just it's just a good feeling to know that they have their guy week one, like regardless of what happens. It's just definitely a good feeling for sure. Well, the thing is not even a talking point. I think that's what the difference. Like even, you know, we've brought back Fitzpatrick after a year where he was in trench starter, Tyrod when he was the entrenched starter, but there were talking points there. There were questions about Fitzpatrick's viability. There were question marks about Tyrod's vi- viability. Even going into camp last year with Josh, there was talking points about his long-term viability as a starting quarterback in this league. There's none of that now. And Casey articulated it super well on Nap's podcast before uh, Nap Knows Buffalo podcast before it even started, but the really nice thing is we don't have to worry about practice reports on him. He had a great practice. Cool. He didn't have a great practice. Cool. He's still a franchise quarterback who was probably just out there trying some new things out. So it, it it's, there's an incredible comfort and in not even, I don't have to turn on WGR and hear Bob from Chicawaga talking about starting the backup quarterback <laughs> week one, as opposed to Josh Allen. Definitely. Definitely. One last thing I want to touch on with this bears game um, you know, I have to say we talked about the depth, right? And, and like, you know, Spencer Brown sort of calmed us down a little bit about Bobby Hart and just in general, his tackle depth. I also feel a little bit more reassured. I think I depth that cornerback as well. I know there are some injuries. I think that that unit was way better last week than it was against the bears. And I want to say something. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of people have been talking about how Neil hasn't looked great, how wild Hughes hasn't looked great. Dane Jackson's had his ups and downs. Although Wild Hughes did have, a, a, I think, a really nice game against the Bears. But I feel like a guy that's been kind of forgotten in the mix is a, is a depth corner. And a guy that actually, I think, depending on how many cornerbacks uh, Brandon B. and Sean McDermott want to keep. Like, I feel like Cam Lewis is someone that people sort of forget about. I think he's a pretty solid backup cornerback in the NFL who can go inside and outside. So I just kind of want to throw that out there. I think I feel like people kind of forget about Cam Lewis and the fact that this, this dude was a starter for a game and, and, and had taken Ter- Taron Johnson's job mid season. Like, I feel like people kind of forget, like that's how much this coaching staff kind of valued him at one point. So I just kind of want to throw that out there that I think the 
panic at cornerback depth. I think people kind of forgot that, hey, there is at least Dane and Cam uh, Lewis that can hold it down as backups. Yeah, and you have Cam Lewis, and you also have Nick McLeod, who's looked Mm -hmm. someone who's maybe got something there. So there's some unique talent, and he's someone who's got some speed too. So there's some unique talent that didn't quite exist there last year in, in the secondary room. Definitely. So we kind of have been talking about a lot, but the bottom of the roster has definitely been, you know, this big discussion point, especially with the team of the Bills where the starters are so kind of lock solid and entrenched. I mean, there was a little bit of, you know, battle at cornerback two between Levi and Dane Jackson. I know that Leslie Frazier says it's still neck and neck, but I, I frankly don't really buy that. I think, I think that is Levi's job at this point, but there's still a lot of competition though. Nonetheless, throughout the whole bottom of the roster. So, I guess, Ryan, we're, we're just looking at numbers because there's a lot of people who are throwing around different numbers, right? Like three quarterbacks or six linebackers, seven receivers, seven DNs, five safeties. You know, we've heard it all. Out of all these position groups, right? Like which one do you feel the Bills might go particularly heavy on? This was a really tough one for me because if you remember earlier in the year, I was very much against seven wide receivers. But you break this down. There's no reason to keep three quarterbacks on this team at this point. They're with the depth at other positions and the drop off that exists from whether you keep Fromm or Webb to Trubisky, it just doesn't make sense. One or both of them can make it back to this practice squad and they'll be fine. If it comes to a situation where we don't have a third quarterback or where we get to the third quarterback, excuse me, then our season's already kind of effed at that point. So it doesn't matter if it's Webb, Fromm, or dude from the street who's got to come in and throw some passes it it'll be is what it is um linebackers one i i as things went on through that detroit game i started to think that there might be six linebackers but they cut terrell adams in this most recent round of cuts so you look at it and you have uh tremaine edmonds matt milano aj klein um uh, my tyler matakevich and then the next guy who's probably on that depth chart is Andre Smith, who's a great special teamer and has played well in linebacker this preseason. And then there's a drop off there. You know, Guile Harris has shown up, flashed a little bit, uh, but that's about it. There's a drop off there. So I think you would be hard pressed to keep six linebackers at that point at position. So then you look at wide receiver where McKenzie has had a camp where he's not even really in the returner battle at this point. He's returning, but he's, the wide, he's on this roster as a wide receiver. And you have Jake Kumaro who stepped up, who Josh Allen seems to adore from all his comments. And Marquis Stevenson, who you guys know that I'm high on, but we turned a kick for a touchdown. And you look at guys who get taken. We talked at, at we talked so for you know the sake of intellectual honesty here, we talked before training camp and we said, well, we normally don't lose guys to waiver when we cut them. But you look at guys who do generally get picked up if you cut them. And a lot of times, if you have someone who's a proficient returner, they'll get picked up. Raymond McLeod, he's not even that good of a returner, but he can return. He got picked up by the Steelers when we cut him. You look at a guy like, you remember Keelan Clay? He wasn't that good of a returner. We cut him, goes back to Carolina. Marcus Swedenson looks like a good returner. He's had some good kickoff returns. We know he's had a good punt return now. I don't know if that's a guy you want to expose to waivers because a team who has an issue or a depth problem at that spot is going to go pick him up. That's And I sound like I'm backtracking my stuff, but look around the league. Those are the kind of guys that get picked up at the de- picked up on waiver wires. So if, I, if you're giving me quarterback, which one? Oh, and defense. And then so out of those three, I think, yes, wide receiver is the most likely. And then you get to defensive end. And the question really is Bam Johnson. And I guess I'll stop there and I'll, I'll I'll let you talk about it. Does Bam Johnson make this team? Because they have a really hard time assessing him there. So I'll quickly say with Stevenson, um, I agree, and I, that with everything you said about him, and and yeah, I know you're you're obviously you've been a big you know Marquez guy from from day one from the day the Bills drafted him. But I have to say, like I know that <coughs> excuse me that, that his training camp hasn't always been, um, you know the the best. But at the end of the day, he's played in two preseason games. And has put explosive big playability on film for 31 uh, other NFL teams. He had the big, you know, pass completion against 
Detroit. He had the punt return. He's no longer a guy that you could, as you said, you could expose to waivers. Now, as I've said, I would not be surprised if he's the kind of guy that he makes the roster and then gets immediately put on IR as kind of a redshirt thing they did with Hodgins last year. Um, I forget who they did the year before. Um, um, they, they Voshan, Voshan Joseph. Voshan Joseph, exactly. I could very well see them doing that with Marquez Stevenson. But like you said, he's making this roster one way or another. They can't let him go. And because they also they have something to work with there, there's no question the ability is there. So I, I wanted to touch on that because, and, and of course, you know, I I know you need to definitely kind of uh, bask in the glory of that because again, you've been getting you know people coming at you on Twitter for months about your Marquez takes, and I, you know what? I, to your credit, they 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 have aged relatively well, so I'll give you have to give you credit with that. But um, half of it yeah. aged well, half of it aged well, half of it aged well, half of it aged well. Marcus Stevenson's good, but Isaiah McKenzie also became really good. Exactly, exactly, but um. But back to, you know, Bam Johnson, Bam Johnson, to me, going into this preseason, I thought was absolutely the odd man out when it came to that D-line room. I just assumed that six ends, was, which is already a crazy high number, was going to be plenty and that they could find that special team's ability elsewhere, you know, from a linebacker, from a safety, somewhere else who can just step in and be that. Well, first of all, as far as the special teamer, we've heard the praise from Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier about him on special teams, how valuable he is to that unit. And then on top of that, you know, Mariotis was a guy that a lot of people talked about, need to step up his game, Epinesa. But all these rookies being drafted, Daryl Johnson also knew he had to step up his game. And Bam has looked awesome during the preseason. I think you know, he's been really great at getting pressure on the quarterback. He's been good stopping the run. Like, he does look like a much better player. And a guy that maybe could come in as a rotational D lineman and give them some snaps if they need it. So... I, I think Bam Johnson has made himself incredibly hard to cut from this roster. And do I think they keep him? Do I? Th- I mean, honestly, it's it's 50-50. It just depends on which direction they want to go into other positions. But I think a way that he does stick on this roster, because this is a, a, a position group that I think the Bills are going to go kind of thin at, is corner. I know I mentioned the depth, but I don't, I don't think the Bills are keeping six cornerbacks anymore. I think they're going to go with four corners. And, and, and that being, you know, Wallace, Trey White, um, Saran Neal, Taron Johnson, and Dane Jackson, which something like that, you know, and maybe even five linebackers could open a spot up easily for Daryl Johnson. So, I mean, he's he's on the bubble, but he's definitely done a lot, I think, to, to be worthy of a spot in that 53-man roster. My only question when it comes to Bam Johnson is who, first of all, who are you cutting? Because from other position groups we talked about with that, but more so who are you going to make an active on game day? You can't keep seven. You it's not going to work with seven defensive line on game day right now. It's kind of trending towards Boogie Basham could be that game day inactive, kind of like AJ Espinessa. But this team has a lot of special team only guys. You got Matakevich, Taiwan Jones, who he didn't dress with the starters in that first game. So he looks like a lock at some point. You have to be more than a special teamer. And maybe he can. He's played well. PP, uh, PFF, take it with a grain of salt, had him as the highest ranked edge rusher of the preseason so far. But at some point, I think he needs to be more than just a pass rusher. And how many, and my question is, how many special teams only guys are you willing to keep on this? I know he, I know Sean McDermott makes it a point to have a really good special teams. And Heath Farwell talks about Bam Johnson as a guy who's in his hip pocket. And I, if you put a gun to my head right now, I think Bam Johnson probably does make this team and they find a way to keep seven. It's, I just get concerned on game day. Who are you taking off the field? What are you removing? Matt Breed is a guy who's looked, he's looking like he's going to make this team and looks like a guy who's going to garner some snaps. He's looks like a guy who could be a unique talent. We talked about this all season, a unique talent in that running back room with speed. Are you going to make him inactive so you can keep six defensive linemen, seven defensive linemen active on game day? That's my question. You know, are, are you going to cut maybe, you know, others, but Saran Neal? Like there's so many, I feel like more so than any other year, really good special teams players on this team, but I just don't know how many special teams only players are you willing to keep? Or are you, is it justifiable to keep if you're taken away from other position groups? Yeah, that's a, that's a totally fair question. And that's going to be a tough decision for Brandon B and Sean McDermott. 
Because like you said, as good as Bam Johnson has been on special teams, and maybe he does even contribute as a as a defender, but yeah, we've talked about it. Even if, like you said, Boogie Bastion was probably trending in the direction of being the AJ Epinesa role where he's sort of been in, you know, inactive for half the season, just learning and, and getting up to speed, you still have six defensive ends who you've activated for a game day on top of likely your four D tackles. So you've already spent on your 46-man game day active roster 10 of those on just D linemen. So it's definitely uh, a tough situation because, again, and, and these are good problems to have. I want to remind everyone that because, like, good players are going to get cut from the Bills this season. And it's unfortunate. It sucks. But that's just, frankly, what it's going to be. There's just a lot of talent on this roster, and not all of it can make it. So, you know, I, I, I don't know where they sort of take – where, you know, Daryl Johnson takes a spot from – Maybe it's a tight end rune. Maybe the only role with Hollister and Knox, but I just don't have a, I have a hard time believing that's going to happen. So, you know, I, I guess to answer your question, Ryan, I am not sure what, what, what they're going to do. But again, I think this is a great problem to have because regardless of what decision they make, they're still going to have, I think, 53 pretty darn talented football players on this roster. Yeah. It, the, the thing is, what I feel like as preseason games, normally go on as training camp normally goes on there's a little bit of clarity there isn't a lot of clarity with this roster after two games or anything it's more muddy we've seen so many different guys step up we've seen so many different guys play well we've had seen so many different guys go have some up and down games and up and down camps this is the hardest now i've only really been doing roster projections for like three years but even going back to when i was just kind of doing this as a casual fan, this roster is just really, really, really hard to predict. And you can, if you told me any one of these scenarios, we talked about six linebackers, seven defensive ends, three quarterbacks, seven wide receivers. You could talk me into any sort of combination just because of the depth that exists at, at those different positions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, there's no question. This is the most talented roster they've had. And again, it's shown because their backups dominated the bears. A lot of their first team guys, a week ago. Now, I do want to ask you, Ryan, like, again, I know you just talked about how things have been muddy. There's not a lot of clarity. Not a lot of guys have really separated themselves because so many guys are playing so well this this preseason training camp. But as of right now, on August 25th, who is one guy you think could be a potential surprise cut for the Bills? I think if you gave me one surprise cut on this roster, I'm going to go Bam Johnson. Just because I just... I don't see how you can keep and use seven defensive linemen, no matter how good he is at special teams. Everyone else is also really good. They got depth of that position. Everyone has this defensive line is getting pressure like crazy, regardless who they put in there. And I know there's a lot of Bam Johnson support. So I'm a little afraid for my mentions right now, but it's just, I think it's going to be hard to justify all these special teams only players especially when we know Matakevich is a lock and we know Taiwan Jones is a lock. And we know, you know, Saran Neal is an elite gunner. So we know he's got to be kept on this team. So I just, I, I just question the, the logic behind keeping seven and maybe taking away, you know, depth of the positions for that. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think that's a good answer. And then, and then a guy that, I mean, for me, like a guy that I've been thinking about, and I've thrown his name around a little bit, uh, but I didn't really think he would be cut. Uh, but that kind of have, has changed a little bit from watching training camp, from hearing about training camp, uh, watching the preseason. I have become less and less sure that Vernon Butler really has a spot on this roster. I know his cap is what his cap number is, and that cutting him really doesn't do anything for the cap. But I just find it interesting that in you know that Vernon Butler. I don't know if anyone noticed. He was playing well into the fourth quarter of that game against the Bears with all the threes and fours, while, um, you know, a guy like Justin Zimmer, who I know left the game with an injury, but came back and then was then pulled. He got pulled pretty early in the Lions game, which sort of made me feel like he maybe he's a guy that they really like. I know right now with with Harrison Phillips' injury that maybe complicates things a little bit, but I I'm really not so sure that the Bills are going to keep Vernon Butler. Just because at the end of the day, say what you want about cap numbers and this and that. It's all about having 
you know, your, your best 53 guys make this roster and what gives you the best chance to win a Super Bowl. And I know this sounds kind of crazy about, you know, talking about rotational D tackles. But if Harrison Phillips and Justin Zimmer give you a better chance than Vernon Butler, then there's no reason to really keep Vernon Butler on this roster. And if you listen to the show last week, Bruce talked about McDermott viewing the defensive line as a unit entirely. So if you just strip away the labels, call them defensive linemen, and you take away Vernon Butler, you know, that's 10 defensive linemen, which is normal. And when you have guys who they drafted to reduce down inside and with Rousseau, and they've done a couple of those packages where they've gone Boogie Rousseau, you know, Oliver and, and Hughes are not Hughes, but another edge rusher on the other side. And, you know, these, I think, uh, Dom, I want to, I forgot, uh, one of my Twitter followers, Dominic calls it their Lambo package that, you know, they, they bring in all their edge rushers and kind of kick them inside. You can get away with maybe only having three defensive linemen on this team, or excuse me, three defensive tackles on this team when you get rid of Vernon Butler. So I think there's very much a, an avenue for that to happen. Because it's not, you know, cut, cutting Butler isn't the most cat-friendly thing in the world. And we've talked about that. But it's not debilitating like maybe some other players on this team. Right. And don't forget, too, a guy who's played a lot in size has been F.A. Obata, who I think is just about a lock on this roster. And they play him a ton inside against Detroit, a lot inside against Chicago. And he can hold up as a three-tech. I mean, not the best in there as a run defender, but as a pass rusher, he can really... Um, do some damage down there. So, you know, th- that's been the biggest thing, I think, with this defensive line. It's just been the versatility. And this is what Sean McDermott, Brandon Breen, Leslie Frazier have talked about all offseason, that these guys can really kind of go all across the defensive line. They can mix and mash combinations just because they have so much versatility, so much flexibility. Uh, and so far, the unit's performed well. So I really, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who they keep and how they use them. Uh, as the season kind of gets close here. Yeah, I, it, it, there's a lot of hard moves to be made. You know, it's a good problem to have. And once again, I'll, I'll direct you guys, if you haven't heard it yet, go listen to our show last week. Bruce had a lot of really good points on the defensive line, talking about how, you know, this defensive line this year could look like what we wanted last year's defensive line to look at, especially with the way they played this uh, preseason so far. And before we kind of... Uh, preview this upcoming preseason game. I also want to ask, so I asked you what you think your biggest surprise cut's going to be. I want to ask you who, who's going to be the surprise guy that makes the roster that no one you know sees coming kind of like last year's Delshawn Phillips. Like who do you think could maybe be that kind of a guy? If there even is one for this roster. I think you've got to look at a guy like Nick McLeod and I have in my players to watch for next week. Um, a guy who has shown up around the ball who's got a lot of physical traits that even Trey and maybe uh, Levi Wallace don't have in terms of his speed. I'm Casey loves him. I did a lot of people out here that, that were in my mentions talking to him after we got him in the draft process. And he was kind of the other undrafted guy. I want to talk about old July Griffin as that guy that could come in and maybe steal a spot. When you look at guys who have flashed, he's a guy that, just every week is around the football. So I think he's my guy who I, if he made the roster would be surprising, but I think also there, there's a real avenue and a real possibility that he could make this roster. I like that answer for sure. He's, he's definitely at the very least a guy that they need to keep around that practice squad and maybe elevate him from time to time if needs be, because um, I like what I've seen from him too. He he's, he's, he's been really impressive. A guy I think I'm going to go with is a guy I've mentioned. I, I think it's Josh Thomas. I know people have talked about him, kind of him versus DeMar Hamlin, but I, I do think that there's a chance that the Bills keep five safeties. I'm not I'm not ruling it out. I don't know how the numbers will work, but I, I, I think that they don't want to lose Josh Thomas. He's put some really good plays on tape, especially in that Detroit game. I was thoroughly impressed with how he stopped the run, and he's exactly what McDermott likes in his DBs. He's physical. He's not afraid of contact. He's a good tackler. He's got... It, you know, versatility where you play the free, the strong. So he's a guy that could find himself a role in this team. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that this is hundred percent likely going to happen or by, by any means, but that's a guy that seems to be a player that McDermott really likes and, and maybe could find his way onto the roster. 
another dude who loves to hit. Another McDermott, another McDermott defensive back that just loves to come down and lay the wood. A guy, and let me tell you, he's built. He's a scary looking dude. I had no idea what Josh Thomas looked like, but he's a he looks like a linebacker with his pads on. Absolutely. So Ryan, the last preseason game's coming up. Home against the Packers. It's the first home game they've had uh, since that Ravens playoff game, and first home game they've had with. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a total sellout, but still lots of fans in the stands. That should be a really awesome scene to see on Saturday. What are three things that you want to see happen in this last preseason game? Number one, I have health. I want to see everyone healthy. What, what I don't really care whether or not Josh plays. If Josh does play, I don't want him on a series. If his offensive line isn't going to be 100% out there, I don't want to see him out there. And if he is out there, I just I don't want to see him sitting in the back and chucking balls. Get him a couple in. Let him get in a couple timing routes. Let him complete a couple passes. Get him out of there if you play him at all. One guy I'm watching, Carlos Basham. I want to see how well he keeps doing. He was a little quiet in that first game against Detroit. Showed up a little bit more in the Bears game. Uh, Bald, I know uh, Brian Baldinger on Twitter put out a little clip of him doing some good things against the Bears. But he's a guy who we, everyone thought was going to be more pro-ready, more ready to step in and play in 2021 but hasn't quite shown that yet. And he's playing deep into the fourth quarter of these games. So I want to see if Carlos Basham comes in and, and shows a little bit more than he's been showing and see if he can earn some playing time on week on the week one roster. And the guy that I talked about just now is surprise cut. I want to see Nick McLeod. I want to see Nick McLeod get more run against maybe higher, better, against better players, you know, maybe throw him out there with the ones, see what he can do because he's a guy who they looks like, has some potential, has some talent, and maybe a guy who down the road could play cornerback at a starting level on this team. So those are the three things. Some health, Carlos Basham, and Nick McLeod. So my first one is also injuries. Just I I, I don't want to see anyone get hurt. And I don't think we're going to see very many of the Bills starters, maybe even less so than what we've seen um, the last two weeks, just because – they're this close to the regular season, and it's clear that this roster is really good and ready to go now. So the last thing I need to see is like Greg Rousseau get rolled up on from behind, or see you know Levi Wallace take some big hit and you know you know get knocked out or so. Just I don't need to see any any player that could play a big role for this team. I don't even need to see them on the field. I've seen all I need to see that know that they're ready to go. And in general, you just don't want to see injuries in the preseason. So yes, health. Number one, for me, I want to still look at Doyle and Spencer Brown. I thought, like you said, Spencer Brown looked way better, and I'm, I'm, I like watching him play. I think he plays with a really kind of nasty mentality, which is, you know, you love to see that from your lineman. And Tommy Doyle has been a guy that has not played great, but I still have hopes for. He's so big, he's so athletic, he's raw, he's learning, but I, I'd like to see him show some signs of improvement. He's been very up and down, to say the least, throughout the preseason. And then the last guy, th this might be a boring answer, but honestly is Matt Hawk. He, for how well he played against Detroit, he was that, that one punt he had against Chicago was an awful punt. I mean, it was a total shank short, not a lot of hang time. And you know, a lot of dolphins has been saying that's kind of Matt Hawk for you. Like, yes, he'll have some beautiful coffin corners, but the hang time and he'll have some just absolute gross knuckleballs that go, you know, 25, 30 yards down the field. And, I'm not saying that I thought Corey Bohorkas was the best player in the world, but I'd like to just see Matt Hawk get some more reps, reps in just so we can be more confident that the few times, hopefully, this Bills offense has to punt that Hawk can deliver for them because the, the easiest way, I think, to let a team back in the game is, is, is struggling with field position and allowing a team to beat them. And punting is a big piece of that. So I'd like to see Hawk really lock it down and, and play like he did against Detroit because I think a lot of people felt really good about him uh, after that Detroit game, and that kind of came crashing down after that Bears game. If McKenzie's hurt, do you think Steve Sims could win a win a job on this team next week? I think there's a a chance. I mean, th like Steve Sims is not like a scrub. You know, I know Washington isn't the best offense, isn't the best team in football, but this guy had a role in their offense and as their special teams return guy for two seasons, uh, and so he's he's not a slouch. 
Like, he's a he's a big time step up from like a Brandon Powell. Um, if McKenzie's injury is serious enough where he gets put on IR or gets put on like the pup or something like that. I think Sims absolutely has a shot to make this roster as the return guy and fill in as that gadget guy because he's his playing style is very similar to McKenzie. His build similar to McKenzie. I think as Sussa would say, he's kind of Isaiah McKenzie, but from just two, three years ago, really. Like just he's not quite as developed as Isaiah. So if C Sims really pops off and McKenzie's injury is serious enough where there's some doubt if he can play, you know, week one, week two, week three. Honestly, I would not have a problem with them keeping Steve Sims on the roster. Yep. And I, I think that's where I'm at too. And you know, he's not, I, someone on Twitter today said that he's kind and I think it was Pierre was going at it with someone talking with someone, not going at it with someone who said that he's basically kind of like Washington's uh, Isaiah McKenzie. And the fact that he kind of became a fan favorite with a kind of gadget role on that offense. So a, a guy to watch for a late addition who could make this team. And you know, one other thing that I really liked that they did in that, Bears game that I kind of like to see him keep doing is I like the fact they went for two a couple times to test some plays mm-hmm. out. I like the fact they went fourth down and uh, yards per pass on Twitter today put out a thing saying, you know, let's use the last preseason game as a chance to do some funky things, some of the more analytical things that people say you should do that no one really does in preseason. You know, onside kicks, um, going forward more on fourth down, limiting your punts. So, you know, I'd like to see, I, I really liked what McDermott and Dable did with that. So I'd like to see if they, if they, get a little play around a little bit more with some of those numbers and try some new things out in this last preseason game, just because they can. Yeah. I mean, why not? It's the preseason. And one last thing I want to, I want to touch on too. And I know that he's kind of become a fan favorite and he had a great game against the bears. And that's, that's Reggie Gilliam. But I do want to ask you this, Ryan, because someone did bring up an interesting point is that how, you know, Gilliam was, has been all pre has been killing it on those third and ones, fourth and ones, those fullback plunges up the middle. I mean, he's been picking up first downs every single time in touchdowns, every time they give him the ball in those, on those plays. And with Josh Allen now being a quarter billion dollar quarterback in the face of this franchise, despite how good he is at those QB sneaks, do you think that this Gilliam fullback dive, you know, situation is something we see throughout the regular season, just again, to protect Josh Allen a little bit more. I hope so. Uh, Reggie Gilliam is what I hope that I always hope Pat DeMarco would have that role. I always hope that Jerome Felton would have that role. I always hope that hope that Frank Summers would have that role. I I think fullback's a fun position. Is he going to be for uh, you check like Zach Vaughn keeps putting out on Twitter? No, probably not. But I think he's a guy that is a super unique talent who's probably a little bit faster than a normal fullback, but offers a little bit more versatility. He's found tons of success. Like you said, I, I, I think he's a suit. He's great on special teams as well. He was a valuable part. I'm pretty sure he was in all 16 games last year, if not close to it as a special teams contributor. So, if, and he also like had some really good blocks. If you go back and you watch the Moss run, I think it is. He has a really good block that springs Moss. He's had a really good preseason, and we I haven't talked about him a lot. We didn't bring him up till now because he's just a guy that as soon as they made that switch to fullback on him, I assumed he was a block because he was the only one listed at that position. He played all 16 games last year, and he's just a guy that I thought he's he has a very specific role in this team that no one else can do. So I I hope that I hope that's a thing that keeps coming because it doesn't seem like teams really have an answer for it, at least in the preseason. Right. And on top of that, he offers a little versatility as a pass catcher because they used him as a tight end last year and he did catch a touchdown pass. So he's he's really got some, a, a nice skill set. And speaking of Pat DeMarco, um, he was on uh, the shout with uh, Talbot and Matt Perino. They, they interviewed him and he mentioned because, you know, DeMarco's last season, uh, Gilliam was as a you know UDFA on the roster. And he was saying that Reggie, you know, really impressed him as a rookie and he's not. And, and, and the success he's seen, you know, so far from Reggie is not a surprise to him that this is a guy who really has a little playmaking ability in him, despite being a fullback. So yeah, he's been definitely a, a fun storyline to watch for sure. So uh, with that being said, Ryan, is there any uh, things you want to promote? Anything you want to kind of plug while we're here? Anything to let our viewers know? Nope. Just keep on, uh, keep on checking us out every Saturday. Keep on checking out all the great stuff where really the website's really ramping up. Uh, Mitch, I know you're now, you're now assistant editor, right? I don't know if that's new. Yep. Or I just never knew that. Um, yep. Yep. 
Oh, oh, yeah, that so is pretty recent. Yeah. That is real. Okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Mitch, Mitch is the assistant editor. So make sure you check out all the writing stuff too. There's some really cool writing stuff that goes out on the website guys. Um, so make sure you check all that stuff out. Yeah, definitely. I definitely uh, echo that for sure. And as always, you know, we thank you for you for listening and for your support. And like we mentioned, if you haven't heard, but when the season starts, we are going to be switching our days to Wednesday as when the, uh, when we're going to be dropping our episodes. So um, the Saturday, we only have, uh, I think, one more Saturday uh, after this one gets pos uh, posted. And then we're going to be on Wednesday. So do look for that when the regular season comes. Uh, but with all that being said, for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you for listening. Have a great rest of your day.